Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Freaky host Eric Ingram here today with Ninja Michael Kester. I just can't stop myself, man. I just you can't. You, there's it's no an reason. obsession I have, and Did I. You know he just has a tattoo cannot. on his penis that says, "What are you looking at?" Oh God, I didn't. Is there a picture of that? Yes. Okay, so if you didn't listen to the last episode of Double Feature, uh, do that. Today we're going to be talking about two totally different films. We're going to be covering The Faculty. Uh -huh. And um, Jackie Brown, which is an Abanda Band Apart production. A uh, Rodriguez movie and a Tarantino movie. These are both movies that the, um, the famous directors directed, but it's kind of their black sheep of the pack. Yeah, no pun intended, uh, where the puns there, may be due. Is there a um, sheep in one of these movies? No, that there's I... black people. Oh, damn it. Um, the other thing that these films have in common is neither of the directors that we always champion for mm -hmm. writing directing producing yeah. starring making music editing right right creating the promo video right. editing the trailer <laughs> they are uh, not the primary writers on they're these not films. rodriguez at the uh, premiere yeah right rodriguez had basically nothing to do with the writing on his um you know what i feel like they both had to do a uh, little with the writing and didn't take yeah enough credit i think tarantino I think, gets a little bit of writing credit well on his. see it's weird and we'll get into it separately but it's amazing that these are the films, first off, like you said, they're the black sheep. They're the ones everyone forgets about when they're sure, thinking about sure. the filmography of our two directors. Unjustly so. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is, is they're both massive ensemble casts. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Which for Tarantino isn't too big of a surprise. But weird um, Tarantino people and right. weird well, Rodriguez it's, people. The thing, is, the thing that's weird is that they're not Tarantino people and they're not Rodriguez yeah. people. Although there's, I feel like we've said that before. There's a Selma Hayek. And sure. there's a Samuel L. Jackson. Right, right. That is it. All right, so we're going to spoil both of these movies. And we and already did. If we, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what? If we didn't make this obvious enough, though, you should see these movies. Yes. Um, Faculty is just a fucking great midnight flick. And John Jackie, Stewart is in it. it. John Stewart's in it. See it because John Stewart's in it, and you watch that John Daly show he does. And then uh, Jackie Brown's a really good Tarantino movie. It's amazing. Michael Keaton is in it. It's not as if, oh, that's not one of the Tarantinos. That's the third Tarantino movie. Yeah, absolutely. There are specific Tarantino movies. That is the third one. Yeah. Fucking see that thing. Or, you know, skip it for now. Use a chapter. Skip over when we ruin the movie and uh, move right along. But let's talk about The Faculty first which is distinctly a 90s film. It so is. I mean, you know, when I mentioned to people this week we were doing The Faculty on the show, everybody, first thing every, anybody says Oh my is, God, I loved that movie. Yeah, oh, that's so the 90s. Yeah. It's a 90s sci-fi. It's yeah. when you were watching Scream and all yeah. those fucking movies, that was coming out. Well, and you know what's really weird about The Faculty in a Rodriguez standpoint, and it's perfect for the 90s mm -hmm. is that we always talk about rodriguez as being a director who spends just as much time making fantastic children's films as he does making really gritty adult films right. i don't mean adult films sure but the faculty is the first film in and probably the only film in rodriguez's entire back catalog where it's distinctly made for people who are teenagers yeah it doesn't cater to a kid's audience and it doesn't mm -hmm. cater to an adult audience. Again, like we always say, they're great for everybody to watch because Robert sure. Rodriguez is just a great filmmaker. But The Faculty is his only film that isn't, you know, really gritty and violent and sexy sure, sure. and also doesn't have a lot of like nose picking jokes. Right, right. It falls between. It falls in the teenage years. It has this uh this incredible nineties edge to it. Yeah. You know? it, does. it seems like a really edgy movie. But you can't quite determine why it's edgy because there's no fucking and it's not, you know, I guess the, the juvenile stuff, sure. it's edgy because there's no well, picking. It's because the goth the is hanging out with the head of the football team. That's <laughs> right. how you make an edgy teen film. Right. Is yeah. you just make stereotypes for each character and then have... Oh, come the, on, man. I think you make an edgy teen film by forcing them all to do drugs at gunpoint. That's, yeah, that's also I mean, good. the jock hanging out with the sure. goth chick from Carnival. 
I feel like we're gonna have to start paying money every time we chuck Carnival into a show. Well, Although, I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna start chucking, don't forget that the jock was from Dexter. Yeah, that's true. Um, the drugs as well, saving the day. Oh, I mean, yeah. that's the. Oh man, you know, it's because of the the content things. It's not so much shock on screen as you're. You know, that was the thing with Planet Terror or true. with a lot of Rodriguez Machete. movies. Machete was a big one we talked about. Um, you know, opening scenes of that and just a lot of things going. Fuck, I can't believe you did that. Those are big Rodriguez things. Mm-hmm. But this is more, you know, when you think about the fact that drugs save the day. Sure. Um, or that everybody has to do drugs all the fucking time. Yeah. It's not even a drug movie. It's just a thing. None of these kids did drugs except the one, probably, uh-huh. maybe a couple of them. Um, but they weren't, you know, all druggy characters. Sure. But suddenly they're doing drugs every couple minutes to prove that right. they're not from Invasion well, of the Body Snatchers. It's the blood burning test from yeah. the thing. It, Only it is. You yeah. have to do drugs constantly mm-hmm. because anytime you've been separated from the pack you may have been robert patrick into being the devil <laughs> right right robert patrick showing up in this movie too you know they um they start acting strange but this isn't quite when we talked about road racers that was another one invasion of the body snatchers came up i yeah. mean that's clearly a kind of a rodriguez thing and probably what brought him to this sure. movie um, i think probably getting paid well, you know, that's it too. He directed and he edited this movie uh-huh. because that was a thing that at the time he had to be the director and editor. That was at least sure. It wasn't so much, oh, I want to do everything artistically on all my films. Even when he's showing up for, you know, uh, they pick Robert Rodriguez up from outside of Home Depot for uh-huh. day labor. Yeah. He directs and edits. That's just how he right. gets things done. And he does it for, I mean, it's $15 million or something, the budget of this. Uh-huh. Which is a step down after doing From Dusk Till Dawn. But uh, I, I think it might also be the only time his movie didn't make back the opening, uh, the budget in the opening of the, you know, of the film. That might have been true of From Dusk Till Dawn as well. But th- this is, I mean, I think you're right. This is what it looks like when Robert Rodriguez is working for Dimension uh-huh. or working for the Weinstein brothers. You know, this is uh, when he's kind of under contract at a studio in like the old system. Right you know, making these uh, these movies for him. And it's something that, while we're going to evangelize it quite a bit, it is super black sheep. I mean, there's no commentary yeah. on this movie. Yeah. Uh, never did one for I think it's his only film that has no uh, commentary. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Even all the kids' films yeah. have commentaries. You know, we talked about Road Racers finally because we were so excited that it got a release. And we talked about that on that show. But it has its own commentary. It has a, a fucking uh, film school. You yeah. Know? Uh, ten minute how to make a, a hot rod action, whatever the oh, fuck I thought you were going to say how to make a breakfast burrito. No, no, it doesn't have a, a cooking school, but that's okay. Cooking school, film school, commentary, all absent from this. He does still talk about the movie in interviews. Uh-huh. So it's not as if he's ashamed of it. Right. Or he's pretending he didn't do it. He loves this movie. Sure. It's just not quite what you think of as a Robert Rodriguez film. He wants to be hands-on. He wants to create everything from the ground up. It's, sure. It's particularly exemplary when you look at what Troublemaker Studios is. Right. Some people would call it Troublemaker Studios. Other people would call it his garage. Right. Um, <laughs> all right. And he likes to be able to, you know, spend all day making Sin City 2. Right. Go in for dinner, hang out with the kids before bed. Right. Go back out. Make more Sin City too. <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah. And the faculty, he was probably, it was before Troublemaker, you know, he's off-site, he's he away from his and family. Out. You know, that yeah, was the that's, thing. It's, it's, he showed is, up on the set, did his thing, and then when the, the hours were over, he had to leave and didn't return to work right. until everybody was back this together. Is, this is probably the moment in his career where filmmaking was a job. Yeah. And... It's still, you know, that what's the fucking phrase? Love what you do. Yeah. And he loves making movies. So yeah. it's not that he's ashamed of it, but the fucking, it's not his baby. You yeah. know, he didn't, the every single is other different. one is his baby. Yeah, exactly. So this is, this is his adopted kid. Right. And you don't <laughs> love right. the adopted kid as much as you wow. love your own kids. Wow. That's Zeke's problem from the beginning. <laughs> they, uh, that and that he wants to fuck a headless teacher. The headless teacher. I mean, the monster effects in this movie, you can see the, the Rodriguez oh, yeah. stuff shine through. It's not, I mean, 
there was an invasion of the body snatchers thing in road racers mm-hmm. and that carries over here yeah this is during the those early moments in his career where he's also just as obsessed with movies he's hanging out with quentin tarantino yeah, that, that one they're, that thing you know <laughs> they're making films together he's uh just a couple years after being poor as hell you know uh in the mariachi days just trying desperately to kind of survive and make a film at the same time so yeah i mean i do think that this is kind of what brought him to the project or elements he highlighted because that's what he latched on to he said oh yeah kind of like the thing you know it, right it's it's a tribute to sci-fi in a lot of those ways but it's a little bit different too it, that thing i was going to mention earlier you know it's not just invasion of the body snatchers i mean they start acting strange but the people the adults that's another part of it too is this is in being a teenage movie all of the adults are infected the faculty yeah. is infected and it's not until every single adult has well past infection that we start moving on to take out members of our group. Playing on that theme, of course, of, you know, the parents don't understand the youth. Sure. Uh, that another brick in the wall kind of thing. Right? Yeah. They act weird, but they continue to function. And so that's what plays on that theme a lot. You know, you're, you're going through everyday society and the adults are even more segmented from the teenage population, the two groups total schism don't talk both part of humanity cannot relate to one another elijah's character and, and clay Duvall's character um even have a, a conversation about you know what kind of things stole from one another mm-hmm. in in sci-fi and they bring up the invasion of the body snatchers a lot um Duvall's character later spoils Invasion of the yeah. Body Snatchers, that fucking jerk. You know, I hear I hear uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers get spoiled a lot in film. Yeah. Now that I think about it, yeah. In fact, no, they, they spoil Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Road Racers. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, they, well, that becomes part of the metaphor of everything that's right. happening there. Yeah, Nick spoils it. Nick gets another shout-out. We talked about uh, Tommy Nicks on that episode Nix gets another shout out and being one of the people uh, called into the principal's office oh, yeah. in this movie. It's an, it's another one of those small moments. I mean, for as much as we talked about this not being a Rodriguez movie, where do you see the Rodriguez in this? Um, well, I think that a lot of it is in the writing. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of it is in... Despite the fact he didn't that do he the didn't writing. he didn't write it. I mean, yeah, but I guess, you know, the the kind of the rebellion aspect. There's mm-hmm. this, this feeling of rebellion... Um, because there's a lot of times there's a rebellion in a really chaotic, anarchistic kind of way. Sure. And this isn't, you know, this isn't rebel without a cause. This isn't fucking, we're fed up and we're sick and tired and we're not going to take it anymore. This is, we are clearly in the right here and nobody will pay attention to that. Two weeks, rebel without a cause reference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, so I think there's that. I think Salma Hayek is a big one. I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think a... Uh, Even Josh Hartnett, for as much as not being... Oh, yeah, that's true. A I Robert about Rodriguez that. actor. And Elijah Wood, both mm-hmm. in Sin City. And uh, Josh Hartnett feels like he's playing a Rodriguez character oh, yeah. more than anybody, you know? I feel like he probably took... I mean, all speculation, and I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I get the feeling that he took a lot from Rodriguez. Well, I think that I think that got coached a lot, you know. From yeah, a well, I think that standpoint. the Rodriguez character in any film is always the one smoking. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. Um, the other people in this movie, I mean, uh, Duvall playing the gothy girl, totally separate from Rodriguez stuff. Robert Patrick sure. being another kind of non-Rodriguez actor, although Rodriguez, a huge fucking fan of Terminator. Sure. Christopher McDonald, we talked about uh, just back on, what was it, Iron Giant? Yeah. As you'll see him everywhere, yeah. really. You will see him everywhere. Right. And, the, of course, fucking shows up on the show several weeks later. And then John Stewart with his infamous brown goatee, which, by the <laughs> way, can we just take a moment? I don't think John Stewart's that bad in this movie. No, I don't. I don't know why Do he people didn't. Think... No, I mean, oh, okay. no, one, no one says that. Okay. But, I mean, he uh, gives himself crap all the time about being a terrible actor, and that's why he only did, you know, Oh, we've done Death half, to of, and half of his fucking movies on this on this show, but I don't know why he doesn't act more or why he didn't act more. Well, maybe I, so much of his life is just sucked out from writing and sure. doing the Daily Show from giving the half time. of the American population the only news they pay attention to. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a big role, which I think is a fine thing. Absolutely. No, I, I was just going to say that show, I think but... that I think that if I had to pick, should John Stewart be funny in movies or should John Stewart <laughs> right. deliver the news to people and make them give a shit well if that's the only choice then stick with the daily show i suppose yeah. 
but yeah, I think he's doing a fine job here. So it's certainly not bad acting. That is the reason he, uh, he doesn't act. Yeah. People who are not in this film are uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar and Charisma Carpenter, both from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh-huh. who turned down roles in huh. this movie. So, fun little game when you're watching The Faculty is imagine if there were people from Buffy the Vampire Slayer in it, and then see what uh, everybody would say it's copying from. Yeah. But back to those Rodriguez things. So, we do have the Selma Hayek, and we have some of these Rodriguez characters Anything else you feel is, is really Rodriguez-y about it? I, I think that a lot of the, the Robert Rodriguez stuff comes from the kids when they're all hanging out. Sure. And they're sure. all holed up places. Right. For right. me. Um, I always think about the scene where the fucking alien queen is swimming in the pool. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the alien stuff, that's it for me. Yeah. I mean, that's where you really see those elements come through. Because before that, you know, you're watching this movie and some of the most distinctive Rodriguez elements... I mean, first of all, the score is so yeah. not Robert Rodriguez at all. I know, it's all. not. And it's amazing when you take out a little bit of, even when he doesn't write his score, you know, he kind of has mariachi bands or his friends or whatever do the, the score in these movies, and it fits. Mm-hmm. When you're instead using the expected 90s score, which isn't doing anything outrageously bad, it's just, you know, 90s score yeah. for a sci-fi horror flick. Well, the thing about any score anywhere is that once something becomes the standard <clears throat> inception, um, then it stops Hate. becoming original. Yeah. And then when you hear it, it it's basically, um, it's the same thing. It's just a write-off. When yeah. you're making a film, it's important to consider every aspect of the film and go, how can I make this stand out? How do I make this unique? Really? Unique? Yeah. yeah. How do I make this complement the whole piece? Sure. And when you take something that you can write off as standard 90s horror right, score, right, right. that's an entire... It's, it's not it's, one of the notable elements. I mean, yeah, you're cutting off one of the five senses of the film all, sure. almost entirely. Well, you're also cutting off one of the Mexican senses of the yeah, film. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's no Mexico to be found anywhere There's some hike, and I think they make her speak in an English, yeah. completely English accent, yeah. and they give her like five lines. Yeah. It's uh, surprising, especially this early. I mean, all of Robert Rodriguez's films have some kind of Mexico something in them. Yeah. Fucking somewhere. We're talking about the creator of mexploitation. Even the word <laughs> right. mexploitation. The word and then eventually the genre and sequel. It's uh, especially this early, though. That's the crazy thing to me is you're between From Dust Till Dawn and Desperado and, you know, obviously Mariachi earlier, but... Um, all this fucking Antonio Banderas stuff, the Selma Hayek era, no Mexico to be found anywhere. It's just bizarre to me. When you know a director backwards and forwards, though, a movie like this is an incredible gem for being um, this fun kind of spot the director you know, yeah. thing. I feel like if you just show me dailies from... 20 random movies I could pick out the Robert Rodriguez movie yeah just from you know the guy has so many movies and I've seen all of sure. them a hundred times yeah. and so finding his signature in this is really fascinating to me because it's just it's this exercise it feels like I've been training for by watching you know the other Robert Rodriguez movies yeah these small little moments like the I mean sometimes it's Easter eggs like the Tommy Nix thing or Sometimes it's uh, Elijah Wood, you know, in his room. It feels like With a Spy on. Kids thing. You know, it's what? With his legs on? Spoiler. I didn't say anything. <laughs> Elijah Wood with legs. Um, but, you know, with all these gadgets feeling like he could have been a spy kid at yeah, the time. Sure. You know what I mean? Through the whole movie, I get that Spy Kids vibe. Yeah. But to get back to that ending, it isn't until you get there that I just feel like now I'm reveling in the unleashed. Right. We've come this far under these constraints. He's playing around in someone else's world. But now we see the monster. Now it's naked girl tentacles, shadow. I mean, that's one of my favorite images. Of the, that is my favorite image yeah. from the whole thing is naked Mary Beth with tentacle shadows. Yeah, I like that it's too. It's just fucking great. I also like that the resolution to the film is those fucking automatic bleachers. What do you mean? They kill the fucking alien by trapping it in the bleachers. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, that's the one thing that I think... You said resolution, and I was thinking, oh, you mean how the the quality of the DVD is oh, so terrible yeah. I can't tell if Mary Beth has nipples or not? Yeah. Yes, the resolution to the <laughs> conflict. Um, one of the resolutions to one of the conflicts. Another potential resolution is to make a fucking weapon out of the arm from a paper cutter. That's true. Which is my absolute fit in any movie. 
favorite unorthodox weapon of all time. And Rodriguez is good at unorthodox weapons. Oh, he so is. And we used to talk a lot about this show, especially year one, just fun weapon choices till we felt like we'd seen them all. But man, just that stupid thing you have in schools that cuts a ton of paper, you just rip the arm off that. And it's kind of like having a machete, but mm-hmm. it, it's just big and powerful and terrifying looking. And I, I love it. It's my favorite fucking thing from the whole movie. Um, one other thing we should talk about, uh, since you brought up the monster, is this is kind of the beginning of Robert Rodriguez and the CGI. Yeah, it um, is. Which, you know, not his fault, somebody else's <laughs> movie. But let's go ahead and blame them for CGI ever finding its way. I mean, blame, but then later Sin City and Planet Terror and Shorts. these triumphant <laughs> CGI moments. <laughs> we have the little, you know, the little fish thing and the crazy tentacles and all that. Yeah. I think just kind of filming stuff on the spot when maybe someone else was telling him, oh, we're going to use CGI for this effect. We're going to put this in later. That might have been. We might be watching his own introduction to CGI in, in filmmaking. Yeah. It was also during the filming of this movie that he got the idea for what would eventually become Planet Terror. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, uh, zombies were completely out at the time. We were doing slasher, revival, self commentary stuff. Uh, in this genre, but I mean, zombies were out as a whole. There was no yeah. zombie anything to be found sure. before the uh, 10 years later, the complete market saturation right. and ongoing saturation of zombies. But Rodriguez wanted to, uh, he wanted to make the big movie that brought zombies back. He felt like zombies came and went and, you know, there were, there were ebbs and flows in the trends of zombies in cinema and he felt like it was going to be time again soon. So he was going to write the zombie movie. And he would talk to the kids when they were filmmaking all the time about how they were going to star in this and whatever. And it wasn't, um, I mean, I've heard him talk, I think it was on the Planet Terror commentary about it. It kind of sounds like a bunch of employees passing time at work. Yeah. I mean, that's what, when every, all the producers were buzzing around doing their thing and they had downtime. They were talking about, oh, we should get together one day and make, you know, the zombie movie. <laughs> also reminds me a lot of the way Robert Rodriguez was casting people. Uh, you know, and before Mariachi, he was doing drug testing where he was in some facility, whereas, you know, where he found one of the actors for Mariachi. Yeah. So they were passing time in there just by talking about, oh, you know, I'm writing a movie. You should be in my movie, you know, and that's kind of where Planet Terror came from. Now, Michael, we wouldn't have a complete conversation uh-huh. about a 90s film if we didn't talk about the soundtrack a little oh bit. Oh, my God. That's so right. Um, there's well, there's only two things I really want to talk about. I mean, there's well, garbage on here or whatever. There's a soundtrack. You mean garbage the band? Or? Yeah, garbage yeah, okay. the band. I was going to say. Stabbing Westward, no, too. When you said there's garbage on here, I, well, I just wanted to clarify that we're talking about also Shirley that. Manson. Um, stabbing Westward, I already had my moment to talk about during my Neil <laughs> Gaiman study of... Yeah. Oh, uh, what was that show? Mirror Mask, right? Yeah. Stabbing yeah. Westward. Where I was came listening to Mirror nothing Mask. but Stabbing Westward and reading Sandman and prep for that show. But um, one kind of extra that does exist for this movie, and this was a, also a distinctly 90s thing, is music video with extra scenes and yeah. fun stuff from sure. the cast of the movie. So there's another brick in the wall, the music video for that. And I remember it psyching me out for the movie back when it came out because Another Brick in the Wall is just a great fucking song. But it's done by this band called The Class of 99. I don't know if you remember that or I you were ever into that. No. So check this out. It was really short fucking lived and it doesn't exist anymore. And I don't even know if they had an album. But the band, The Class of 99, was the singer from Alice in Chains, the drummer from Jane's Addiction, Tom Morello. And I think it was the guy from uh, Porno for Pyros. The oh, fucking my 90s God. Is, is that, by the way, You're Porno for Pyros. You're kidding me. Yeah, but they all got together and they made the Another Brick in the Wall song. That's fucking And then a bunch awesome. of the cast did the fucking video for it. Anyways, Jackie Brown. <laughs> it's just a weird thing. Um, the opening of Jackie Brown is what I want to talk about. Uh, the whole time? You just want to talk the about the opening? The entire time. No, it's what I want to start talking about because the movie starts with it and it gives me a goddamn excuse. You're talking about the uh, the moving sidewalk with the profile? Yeah. How fucking 70s is that? It's, no, yeah. That is talking the about most being fucking... immersed in 90s. Now we're just going to immerse ourselves in the 70s. It's so black exploitation to take your main character and have mm-hmm. them you know, walk, drive, yep. right. you know, sit on an elevator, 
sit in a waiting room sure and then sure. have an entire score yep uh that let the music swells do all the work and let yeah and have that the was score. shaft right when Say, we talked yeah, about shaft, shaft it's in shaft we're wandering around it's the in town coffee and, yep it's in sheba baby oh my god it's in boss nigger sure what it is you do this in black exploitation films you have a song that's about your main character yep and instead of show them do badass stuff you just show them sure it's 110th street right yeah yeah such a fucking good song too um she's standing dead still just staring forward and the background behind her is you know it's changing it's got such a 70s sensibility to it even beyond the the black exploitation element of it yeah just seeing this and you know watching it thinking well what the fuck is happening is this just an artsy when we talked about foxy brown so much of that was fashion and yeah all of that stuff and now i'm seeing pam greer again and kind of going oh we're doing a fashion whatever thing i never really forget when i watch this movie what's actually happening in it yeah because i think it's so clever they're taking advantage of uh one of the unique devices that's really only in airports yeah which is such a waste it is you have these giant you know terminal uh they're like escalators but they're, they're flat escalators yeah it's a flat escalator that's exactly what it is just going down that a really great opening for a movie that then forgets Jackie Brown as a character for a while. Right. We uh, we come back to, you know, Ordell, and we learn about Ordell's character. And it's not until uh, we don't really, really learn who Jackie Brown is until kind of the moments where she comes back from prison. Yeah, and, and she's being interrogated about yeah, the money right. and the drugs right. and the, who is Batman. Well, I feel like the moment we really learn who she is is after that interrogation, she comes back to Ordell and, you know, we think, oh, she's setting him up. And then she just starts telling him everything, yeah. you know, that's going on. And so we still don't really know where the the power play is sure, or where the con's going to be. But we do know, oh, Jackie Brown's not as straightforward as we thought. Uh -huh. She's a lot tougher. She's trying to trick somebody here. Sure. So we at least know she's, you know, she's in it to trick somebody. And, and that's kind of what ends up being one of the more fascinating parts of the film mm. is every time you finally, you see the long con. Right. She tells somebody about it. Yeah. And, and then you go, well, I guess that's not it. It's a fantastic version of a heist because. Sure. She has all these people working with her. Sure. Everyone's working with her, and most people are on the same page, and she still manages to just, it's all her. She wins. This is, and I mean, we should talk about Pam Greer before really getting into the character of Jackie Brown, but uh, Quentin Tarantino was starting to get this reputation when this came out of bringing people back. Yeah. That was a thing that, oddly, uh, we've never really talked about that element of yeah. Tarantino. And I've seen the list, and I've actually memorized the list because of the punchline. The punchline. The, there's a punchline to the list. Uh -huh. Have you seen the list? Well, I I can tell you, you know, Harvey Keitel and John Travolta were the ones right, right before this. Sure. And then this one, it's Robert Forster. Sure. Um, and I mean, Pam Greer. But yeah, Robert Pam Greer Forster, was doing pretty well at the yeah, time. Robert yeah. Forster was the, the big one they brought back. And then after that, it's Kill Bill, mm -hmm. where he brings back um, Michael Madsen. Sure. Brings back David Carradine. Sure. And in much the same way as uh, Pam Greer in this movie, who's doing okay, but you know now it's time for stardom. There right. was Uma Thurman at the time, right? Who's doing fine, sure, but then became a list leading lady. Yeah, but the punchline because it skips Death Proof appropriately, and the punchline is uh, Inglorious Bastards, sure, where it says person Tarantino brought back Quentin Tarantino, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, that seems to happen with all his movies. You know, it, he takes some time to really make a great, solid film uh, rather than churning things out. Sure, although I would definitely say that the time between Inglorious Bastards and Django Unchained didn't seem to... <laughs> it didn't seem to wane my interest in Tarantino. I was kind of always on board. All right, so Tarantino is back then. Well, at the time when Jackie Brown came out, I... Um, and I think a lot of the reason that conversation didn't come up was largely because... Jackie Brown wasn't, you, you know, after Pulp Fiction, I mean, it's the biggest fucking movie of sure. all time. It's hard to uh, create a movie that's more of a success than that. Yeah. So a lot of people naturally look back at Quentin Tarantino's kind of pantheon and go, well, Jackie Brown, that's, you know, the failure of a film. Right. That's, yeah. No, you're, that's not true at all because it's a fucking amazing yeah. film. And I believe I mean, you get on board with that, right? Sure. Amazing yeah. film. It Jackie is. It's, Brown. it's, I think Jackie Brown is definitely, uh, it's in my top three Tarantino oh, films. God, I love it. 
But at the time, I couldn't see the Tarantino so much yeah. because I'd just seen Pulp Fiction. Now I'm seeing Jackie Brown and going, well, where is Tarantino in this movie? But then you see Kill Bill. Yeah. And now you start making right. the connections. Well, I think a lot of the Tarantino in this film comes from the dialogue. And, yeah. um, and I know we always kind of, we, we backhandedly compliment Tarantino on sure. his dialogue sure. writing. And I'm just going to give him another backhanded fucking compliment. Sure. He's an amazing dialogue writer, but God damn, does he know it. Right. And you take a character like Ordell. Sure. And you take the dialogue that Ordell has and that Beaumont and Ordell yeah. kind of have. Oh, that exchange is great. These yeah. are, this is dialogue. It's Those are Pulp Fiction-y moments. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. it's super Tarantino-y because it's this wonderful ability he has to have people shoot the shit mm -hmm. and reveal their character. Right. Um, right. One of the most iconic lines for me in Jackie Brown is... The AK-47. Yeah, When right. you absolutely, positively got to kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitutes. Right. And then well, that that's line... Chicks with guns, right? Which right. is also yeah. one of my favorite bits from the whole thing. Yeah, that line followed by De Niro's reaction, followed yeah. by Bridget Fonda's description of why sure, he's using sure, that line. Sure, All three of those characters become so transparent all at once. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's very telling of those. Although you bring up Lewis... I mean, that is, we'll get to Jackie Brown, I swear. But uh, Lewis the film is didn't the, yet, so we won't have to. Lewis is the anti-Tarantino character. He man. so is. I, but he's he, also the anti-De Niro character. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. I, I mean, De Niro is doing the entire thing with, uh, without speaking. It's basically <laughs> a fucking silent role for him. He, and he does a lot without saying anything. Sure. You know, it's the way he mopes around and is... The way you can see how prison fucking yeah. broke him. You it's, know? it's so funny to, to see Robert De Niro and furthermore to see Tarantino and on a third level to see a movie with a primarily, you know, with all the leads being black actors. Sure. Uh, to have the comic relief. First of all, having comic relief in a Tarantino film sure. doesn't happen. Sure. Two, having it be Robert De Niro sure. doesn't happen. And three having it be the white guy yeah. and he's acting like a white guy right, right because you kind of have this thing chris tucker perfect example go back to fifth element yeah you have chris ruby tucker rod. not the comic relief in right. this movie ruby rod is the is the comic relief because he's so black <laughs> right but well it's so black and so fucking feminine amazing. I yeah think he's is. yeah but he becomes he's just a he's a caricature yeah right uh in this film it's a personality this is, that was his role in the movie right this is a caricature of the stale white guy sure as the comic relief this is something you well, don't he's one do. of those old film noir heist guys yeah. who went to jail and now right. he gets out and he just uh, he's a sponge he just sits in rooms and you never know if he's master plotting or if he's lost Masturbated. his edge and well yeah that's that's the thing is you start to see him alone with melanie and those are the moments that are a little more telling because they talk a little bit you're sitting there, you know, analyzing what he's saying for details about his character. Like you might learn something now when, when he's not talking, I mean, that's when you're learning things about him. Right. But I think that's a really unique role looking at, you know, I don't know if Tarantino's ever really done anything like that as far as such a fucking silent role. I mean, he had Theo, the fucking bellhop talking in his silent role in four rooms, you know, he's. Quentin Tarantino is like the reason that Theo is not a silent role in that right. movie. And, uh, and we talk about his dialogue all the time. And here's a character, basically an anti-dialogue role. All right, but back to Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown, Pam Greer, uh -huh. who we've talked about before. Sure. Pam Greer, Escape from L.A., I think we talked about a lot. We did the Coffee uh, Foxy, Foxy Brown, Brown show. Experiment. If only so that we didn't have to have a whole Pam Greer chunk on today's show right. a year later. But, uh, you know, he's casting Pam Greer as, first of all, a person, you know, in her 40s. And, uh, and Jackie's age is, I think, one of the reasons you might underestimate her. You think she's a lot more fragile than she is sure. as you're getting to know her. It's one of those things that every time I rewatch the film, I remember, okay, Pam Greer, going to be a badass in this movie. But I don't believe it for a while because of how... You know, she's just getting struck down over it. Sure. She's in that parking garage and they nail her for the money. And then they're interrogating her and she's in prison. She mentions several times in the movie that she only makes $16,000, which by any standard is, you know, even when you just compare sixteen grand a year to the amount of money she's carrying in her bag. Sure. That makes that a huge deal. Yeah. sixteen grand a year is far below the level of fucking poverty. Mm -hmm. How do you live off that? 
and uh and you know you see her house and she's doing okay but she's in this existence where she doesn't take shit from anybody she doesn't take shit from her wage you know she has this job she goes in she does it she doesn't make a lot of money doing it but she just fucking does it and she has these exchanges with Ordell and she is not taking anything from Ordell and she doesn't take anything from the cops she just fucking will not deal with other people trying to manipulate her. Right. You know? There comes moments where she has to just verbally smack down, especially Ordell. I mean, just get in shouting matches with him to let to reassert her dominance, to mm. let him know who's boss. And I think all the characters, for one, they all underestimate her. I mean, when when uh she meets the two cops, the ATF guys. Uh, they assume this is, you know, this is vulnerable fucking flight attendant. Yeah. has nothing in her life. She'll be easy. Sure. And, <laughs> I mean, that's the whole, that's the crux of the right. fucking movie is that she isn't. But when you're thinking about, uh, a, I use that phrase, tough as nails character, you're not thinking about Uma Thurman, sleek ninja, kicking ass. I mean, this is a character who's pretty subtle. I think Jackie Brown all around as a movie is one of Tarantino's more subtle yeah, films. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's not uh, really until you're you're watching the movie intentionally studying this character that you realize, I mean, she can play people. She can she's a smart woman. Yeah. She's been around the block. That's part of what made Pam Grier's age important in this mm-hmm. movie. Is she's in her mid 40s doing this bullshit job? That's because she knows the world. Mm-hmm. She's been around, she gets it. And they're using somebody like Pam Greer, who was the ass kicker in the 70s, yes. who was the ass kicker in the 80s. Now she's coming back and she's using her intellect when it's called for. She's using, uh, you know, she steals uh, Max's gun in yeah. that great, you know, split screen sure. uh, reveal yeah. that, that I like so a lot. Good. There is, um, there's really only one completely boss shot of her. Uh, but I do like it a lot. It's at the end where she's, you know, she's in dark and she's got that edge light and she's smoking in her suit. That's the moment where we've earned it. Yeah. That's the moment where this whole time Jackie Brown has been intellectually smart and she's been not taking anybody's shit smart and she's been making the right plays at the right moment. And then we we get this scene at the end where we do get to see her sit at the desk and just be a complete yeah. badass. In opposition to something like Uma Thurman's role in Kill Bill, sure. which is just I'm going to show you in every scene yeah. how fucking great I well, am. And, and the difference is that that uh, Jackie Brown's revenge, it's still a revenge flick. I feel, and I think it's I think it's yeah, I could see that it grows on what you just said. She knows the world, and she's like, all right, I'm getting mine. Yeah, like I've it's been a little little revenge down. on the world. It's, right. It's maybe not so much revenge because revenge seems like it comes from a place of hate. Right. But I think she's just finally sick of it, and she's like, I deserve this. Sure. I deserve something good. Right. And I haven't had much. And, and now she's just going to fucking take just, it. Well, she sees the opportunity. This and, is the moment, and, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, a step below a Robin Hood opportunity. Ordell doesn't fucking deserve it. Sure. Um, well, and Ordell is also, I mean, to shoot Samuel Jackson like this, he is not shot, you know, in these kind of boss shots. No. He's not shot in the Quentin Tarantino, Pulp Fiction, badass... Sure. Um, he's shot like a fucking weasel. He's a, he is he's weaseling a, in every yeah. situation. He he's, won't answer his own fucking telephone. Right. He's a he's a he's a gangster in in not in the sideways gun sense, but in sure. the the way you survive doing crime yeah. is by being sneaky, underhanded, convincing people to get in the trunk of your car sure. so that you can just shoot them in cold blood at point blank right. range and the dirty trunk. Yeah. And one of Chris Tucker's really only comedic moments from the thing. <laughs> I was so surprised. I remember that distinctly all the way back when I saw it uh, the first time, not believing that he shot him. Yeah. That that was a, because sure. Ordell plots and Ordell plans. He's uh-huh. not a smart guy, but he's got all of this, uh, this kind of written knowledge, you sure. know, from watching chicks with guns. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's got, uh, he kind of knows the, I mean, they're always sitting around the apartment watching old exploitation flicks yeah. and stuff. So he's got this plan where he goes, all right, this guy's going to snitch. I have to kill him. But he goes there and he immediately starts going, all right, here's the plan. Tomorrow I'm going to pick you up, do all this stuff. You know, uh, he won't get in the trunk. So 
oh, why don't we go out to a diner afterwards? You know, we'll get all this food. It'll be great. He's making so many future plans that, you know, if I were standing in that character's shoes, I would probably think, well, even if this guy's going to kill me, he'll probably do it tomorrow after we, you know, after we've right. gone out for the breakfast he said we were going to have or whatever, uh -huh. you know? So he shoots him and it fucking surprises me a lot. Yeah, and I always remember that. That's always the shot I remember from Jackie Brown when he puts him in the car and the camera pans up and back and up and back. Sure, sure. And then sure. he just pulls into the field and yeah. bang, bang, Beaumont's dead. Yeah, that's kind of how all of the kills in the movie happen. Yeah. Uh, with the exception of that parking lot kill, which is just immediate yeah. and shocking. I mean, when he kills Lewis at the end, it's the same thing. He kind of turns to him and the whole time I'm thinking, oh yeah, this is how he does it. Uh -huh. you know? And the movie has just enough dialogue to throw me off from the yep. fact that it happens at the end. It makes me think for a second he might not. So that's Ordell and he's the weasel. But I think uh, Max, the bondsman, is a super interesting role too. Yeah, I do. I think that as far as the Tarantino role goes, Robert Forster and Max are probably one of the stranger ones in Tarantino history because... Very rarely in Tarantino films do you get anybody so motivated by romance and by right, right. you know being the good guy and and looking out for someone who who's just had it tough. I mean, Max is so real. Yeah. He's so. I mean, he's picked up from Earth and planted in the Tarantino sure, universe. Sure. Um, and you don't know that really till the end, right? The guy plays it so straight that you're just not sure where you know his allegiance lies. Sure. You get um, enough starry-eyed close-ups right. to, to yeah, understand do. that he's probably at least attracted to Jackie. But sure, sure. you also kind of get this idea that he's maybe not a criminal or even able to be a criminal. Right. And then you get these glimpses of, yeah, you sit in their room with the stun gun. Right. And when they come home, you stun them and you put the handcuffs on them and you drag them to right. prison. Well, that's where I see that as a Tarantino character is he's one of these uh, these guys Tarantino has once in a while that just has an odd job. Yeah. Um, you know, like the Nazi detective kind right. of job. You know, this is uh, this role is I mean, it's crazy because he's kind of the law when you're introduced to him. You're you're seeing him communicate with police and mm -hmm. he carries a gun, but he's a bounty hunter. He's not the law. Right. So, you know, Ordell goes to him, and Ordell doesn't know if he can confide in him. Is this kind of a lawyer relationship? Is that, I mean, what is the dynamic here? Um, usually when you're talking to a bondsman, it's because he's fucking bringing, I mean, that's the, that's the action idea you get, is that he's hiding in the apartment mm -hmm. waiting to pick you up and take you back for fucking bounty. So he's the law, and at the same time, he isn't. And he has no real loyalty. He wants to go to a cop bar. You just constantly go back and forth with, you know, is this guy, does he have a criminal element to him? Is he just doing a completely independent job? Right. Does he have a lot of friends who are officers? And throughout the whole movie, he's another one of those characters that every time he says something, you're eating it up as a detail as sure. far as, can I guess this guy's motivations now? Do I know where his play is going to be in the end? Who is he really trying to help here? And Jackie wins out above you know, any of his moralistic compass because he's into Jackie. Mm -hmm. He wants to see her succeed, whether because he's romantically interested in her or because he identifies with her just as both being, uh, we're in our 40s and I had gray hair and I did something about it, you know, right. that kind of stuff. One of my favorite scenes is where Jackie asks him the hypothetical, you know, if you could take the money, would you? And he's almost caught off guard by that question. You know, oh, if I were you, if I were this per No, if you were you, I mean, I'm just asking you a fucking question. Uh -huh. Play the hypothetical. And it's so telling because he's letting his guard down. He's speaking kind of unofficially off the record. I mean, that's one of the, the key moments where you get a sense of who he is right. by giving him a hypothetical question, mm -hmm. by just going, oh, would you, would you take this money? I mean, how... What would you do with it? You know, you yeah. learn a lot about him from how he responds to that. And I think it, it develops that relationship between the two of them as well by kind of forcing that guard down, creating that, um, that closeness yeah. uh, between him and Jackie. When I mentioned that I saw a lot of Kill Bill in this, yeah. one of the very Tarantino moments was uh, the tension when Ordell first comes back to Jackie's place. Mm -hmm. It reminded me a lot of that, you know, 
he comes back there and he's putting on the gloves and you know that he's going to go in there to kill her. And you kind of know that she knows that too. Right. And he closes the door behind him. And so they're both just kind of standing there. And eventually it's, are they going to snap into action right away or what's going to happen? It reminds me of the scene from the first Kill Bill between uh, the bride and Vernita Green when she first comes to uh, her house, Copperhead, yeah, right? right. And I mean, there's a lot of just ass-kicking going on there, but there's a couple moments uh, in that scene where there's just tension. They can't do anything. They have to kind of talk. Every time someone turns their back, you're worried there's a knife flying through mm-hmm. it. And that's the same way with this scene. You know, he comes in the house, and Jackie has to make the decision. She either fucking shoots him right there, or kind of waits to see where the how this is going to play out. Right. And, you know, th- she does. She goes to make him coffee or whatever. He starts dimming the lights. I mean, you know right away. But uh, she gets the upper hand in that situation, as she does in, you know, in all her situations. And we haven't credited Tarantino enough for the way he can build tension in those uh, in those moments. You know, there's nothing even going on in there, but just by the setup of we saw one of those characters make a kill before we've seen uh, Jackie be pretty vulnerable. But, you know, now there's a moment where we're in a movie called Jackie Brown. She's not going to die. What's going to happen here? And what we get is an actionless showdown. And that creates, you know, that tension. We should look for that dynamic a lot more in future Tarantino stuff because Mm -hmm. I think the way he does that is that's something that kind of deserves study in its own. A couple alternate takes and angles later, I'm still (laughs) confused about who put the money where and what type of uh, need a flow chart or something for that. We need uh, Batman. We have a website. What? Batman. Oh, you mean Michael Keaton? Yeah. Batman is not going to help us out of this situation. <laughs> Batman does not know where the money is. Um, website's doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, if you know where the money is, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. <laughs> Find out where the money went. I just wh- right. I want to know how much is in each bag at each time, what's going on. I just, uh, no one knows what we're talking about because they chaptered over. What movies are we doing next time? Uh, next time we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do Darkon. We're gonna do The Ward. Yeah, Darkon's a documentary, so that's how you'll find it because it's a documentary. And The Ward is a new John Carpenter. It's the new John Carpenter. I'm really excited, Eric. Watch more fucking film. Bye.